110k. Wow. Disgusting. Wow. Linus limping the sevens. Whatever, and this is just, this is artwork right there. What a hand. I almost never want to predict what Linus is going to do. Linus now Jack-10. You can see him at his... This guy is just on a different level, right? Overbetting is one of the most powerful weapons in No Limit Hold'em. When you have a strong range and your opponent is capped, overbetting is a great way to leverage that and get max value with your best hands. But at the highest levels you need to be balanced or you will be outplayed. You can't just always overbet for value, you also need to be able to do it as a bluff. But how do you decide when and which hands to overbet bluff? Let's learn from the best. In this hand, Stefan Burakov aka Stefan11222 opens 5-6 off in a heads up against Linus Love and gets called by Ace-9 off. He c-bets the flop for a small sizing which is the only sizing that is used by GTO Wizard, both for Stefan's combo 6-5 off and also for his whole range. Linus has an easy call with second pair and top kicker and we see a king on the turn. Stefan decides to barrel his hand for a bigger sizing. If bet, this is also the most used sizing by the solver. In this spot, the solver is betting rarely overall and with a more polarized range than on the flop. The weakest hands that bet for value are just a few 9x, mostly ace 9, and the majority, more than 25%, are trips and better. These are offset by around 50% of non-made hands, or simply put, bluffs, which consists of semi draws like flush draws and gut shots, but also hands with close to zero equity. One of those is 6-5 off. And while it might look like madness at first glance, it is also a perfect example of a river overbet according to theory. But why is 6-5 off a good candidate to do that? Well, the first thing we look at when deciding on whether we want to bluff, and even bet in general, even take any action in general, is our overall range. In this river spot, the solver likes betting a rather polarized range, betting anything from around two thirds part to a 150% overbet. As the button, we have a large amount of king x which we want to bet for maximum value against the range which should include less king x, either because they are often 3 bet preflop or check raised on earlier streets. Alongside these value hands, we have bluffs, which brings us to the next factor to consider our hand class. In this case, the correlation is rather simple and black and white with only a little bit of grey. We bet big with our strongest hands, trips and better, as well as with our weakest hands, jack high and worse, and have only a few medium sized hands which mainly want to go for smaller sizings. Now we need to choose from a large amount of combinations that could possibly be bluffed, because if we bluffed them all, they would heavily outweigh our value bets. In this step, we consider our individual hand, our combination's blocking ability. Here, the 5 and the 6 block some of Linus's most frequent King X hands, which are King 5 and King 6 off. As King 10 and better are often 3 bet preflop, and King 9, King 3, and King Deuce are blocked by the board, there are only so many King X left that Linus could have at full frequency. Blocking these will have a significant effect because it decreases the probability that Linus has a hand that can call through. At the same time, Stefan's exact hand, 5 of hearts and 6 of spades, unblocks a lot of Linus's flop floats that will fold on the turn, which are backed off flush draws including a club or a diamond. So not having these cards works in the opposite way and increases the likelihood that Linus has a hand that cannot call through. For the same reason, a hand like pocket kings, which is a better hand in an absolute sense than ace king, prefers betting less than the pot, while ace-king likes overbetting. When we have kings, we simply block away all of our opponent's king x, so we prefer giving them a better price to call with one of their other hands. 
Ace King on the other hand can still get caught by a worse king when we overbet. So even though kings and ace king are in the same hand class, strong value hands, their individual hand and blocking effect lead to a different preferred betting strategy. In this hand, it didn't make a difference as Linus had a hand that was not affected by the blocker effect and correctly called down. GT officer approves. But even though these guys are the best at what they're doing, they don't always please officer GT. Or maybe that's because they are the best? In this hand, Linus opens 10-5 suited and Stefan calls Queen Jack off. On the flop, Linus's range has a big advantage, so he can bet a lot of his range for a small sizing. However, he decides to aim for a bit more fold equity with this 10-5 of hearts and bets on the bigger side, which is also a viable strategy. With so many weaker hands in his range and expecting a very wide c-betting range from Linus, Stefan can call his queen jack high even against the big bet. The ace on the turn then allows for interesting action. An overbet. This is a common spot where the preflop raiser has a significant nut advantage due to all the top hands in their range which the big blind doesn't have. First and foremost ace king, aces and kings, but also sets and some strong top pairs. Again, he wants to leverage this by getting the most value with these and putting a capped range under pressure. And again, the betting strategy becomes polar, which means the hand classes that are chosen as value are top pairs and better. So which hands do we choose for bluffing? Well, in this spot, the solver heavily prefers not choosing random non-equity hands, such as 10-5 of hearts, but instead likes to take semi-bluffs such as flush draws and gut shots, and also takes our bottom pair hands and turns them into a bluff. Searching for the why, we look at Stefan's calling range and see that a significant part of it is two pair, which often includes a three. So in this spot, where his calling range is rather narrow, having a blocker tour part of this range is extremely helpful. So why does this happen? Neither betting 10-5 suited on the turn nor calling queen jack off on the turn or the river are a solver approved. Well, I'm sorry, but GTO isn't everything. In these spots, it can be quite difficult for the defender, Stefan in the spot, to find the right bluff catching hands and call down these huge bets often enough. Calling down single pairs of eights for your whole stack isn't exactly an easy decision. So bluffing more than optimal might be a good exploit against many players who could tend to overfold here. However, we are talking about Stefan. And Stefan is not afraid. If he assumes that Linus is overbluffing here, he should be calling much wider than the solver suggests. According to GTO, calling queen high would be a disaster as he wouldn't even beat Linus's bluffs as they would be mostly centered around bottom pair as we figured out earlier. So calling this hand here means he either exactly assumed Linus's deviation to add more non-pair hands as bluffs, which is genius, or it is simply complete madness. What do you think? In this hand, Crazy Gamble seabets his open ender for 50% pot. If given these three options, the solver would go with the bigger one of 75% pot. EVs are close, however. Linus's a7 is just a call and he barely raises any hands. On the turn, the 120% overbet is in fact a big part of 6-8's betting strategy and Linus has an easy call again. On the river, betting 120% again is again a good choice and Linus's exact combo would be a fold here, however, most other a7s are a call. But if we let GTO Wizard choose the single best sizing for us, we can see that it would bet pot on the flop and on the turn, and then go ahead and jam the river. Against that line, A7 would also be a call down, and 6-8 would have gotten a lot more value. What do Linus Love, OTB Red Baron and Bowser have in common? We'll get back to that after a short travel back in time. On March 22, 2013, a 2 plus 2 account called Deeps opened a thread with the goal of running up his $150 bankroll on NL10 to $240, so that he could play NL16 on PokerStars. 
the screen name Linus Love. Around the same time, OTB Red Baron posted a graph of his 8 tabling session at NL10K, where he made $40,000 on a single day. Five and a half years later, both of these guys are the end bosses of No Limit Hold'em and meet for a heads up session on PokerStars' 5100 tables. In one of their hands, Linus opens Ace-7 off and OTB calls. Linus C-bets on King-8-4 suited and OTB calls again. On a turned ace, Linus chooses to check behind his top pair. The river is the seven of hearts. And OTB... Bets. Three times pot. To many, this line isn't surprising. What's happening is that OTB is making use of his nut advantage on the river. After Linus checked back his hand on the turn, he is unlikely to still have hearts on the river, since he would likely barrel a flush draw on the turn. This is confirmed by the solver strategy, which has Linus check back only 23% of all flush draws on the turn. As a result, his range on the river only includes around 2% flushes. OTB on the other hand, check calls 60% of his flushes on the flop, which makes his river range consist of almost 5% flushes here. Adding to that, he also has a bunch of 5-6 offshoot hands, which also check out the flop and are now a straight. With such an advantage in nut hands, he's best served by overbetting his best hands, plus some bluffs. This leverages the fact that Linus has to call some percentage of his hands, otherwise OTB would print money with his bluffs, and these hands will pay off OTB's value hands big time. He applied the same concept in this hand when Linus 3-bet pre, OTB called, and Linus doesn't see bet the flop. OTB checks back, and Linus then bets the turn which completes a possible flush for around 30% of the pot. OTB calls, and on the river, Linus black bets again for around 25% pot. Both black bets would be the solver's preferred size, as Linus' range misses a lot of the best hands when he didn't see bet. Linus' range simply includes less nut hands than OTB's on this turn, which is a big factor when considering a small or a big bet size. Compare this turn to an ace of spades for example, where imposition doesn't have a nut advantage, and you see a big bet being the favorite bet size. But on the nine of clubs, OTB's range includes more nuts, as he would check behind more flush draws on the flop, than Linus would check as the preflop raiser, which again allows him to do this. With his black bets, Linus is basically saying he mostly has a thin value hand, which is represented in his range. Now a world class player like Linus will be capable of balancing his range here, so that he isn't only doing this with marginal hands. But imagine seeing this from a small stakes rack that you know is playing in ABC style and isn't known for being tricky. You could almost always expect them to bet big when they do happen to have a flush here, because they want to get value. In that spot, they would practically be capped. So putting them all in like OTB does here, puts them in a spot where they A, fold close to 100% of their range, which means you could bluff them like crazy, or B, decide to bluff catch with some of their non-nut hands, which means you get paid off a bigger amount when you jam your value hands. And if indeed you expect their range to be capped, you could even extend your value range and jam thinner hands than only flushes for value. Making use of these situations in which your range has a nut advantage because your opponent is partly or completely capped can add a huge extra to your win rate. But instead of waiting for these situations to appear, what if you could force them to happen more often? This is what I call the OTB special. Why? Because OTB Rod Baron was a master of this method and he was also the first one I saw do it regularly and introduce it to the mainstream. Let's look at an example. In this hand, he opens the button, Linus calls, and on jack 3 deuce suited, OTB gets check raised. He calls, and the turn again brings in the flush. Linus decides to check. OTB now goes ahead and bets a small sizing of 30%, which is also the solver's favorite, since it allows him to bet hands as thin as jack x and even 9x. And not only does it force Linus to defend hands as weak as queen 3 and ace deuce, 
while also getting him to fold equity with open-ended straight draws like 4-5, it also forces him to raise the majority of his flushes, especially the high ones. Which means when he just calls, his range again includes less nut hands. In which case, an overbet is a great choice for a bet size. The OTB Special. Creating spots where you narrow your opponent's range so that they are capped is not only a GTO strategy as the solver proves, it can be an even better exploit. Because unlike liners and OTB, most of our opponents are not world class players who try and manage to be balanced in every spot. So in reality, people will tend to play strategies that are much purer, which means in some spots they never have any nut hands. Exploit that and the profit is all yours. If you apply this, your opponents, just like OTBs, Linus's and Bose's opponents will have to perform above their standards or they will get completely crushed. Queen 7 off, suit for Aaron Zhang on the dealer button. Linus with Jack 10 completes. Aaron Zhang picking up the best hand will come in with a continuation bet. Linus now Jack 10. You can see him actually thinking about making a play. Aaron Zhang not getting shaken will make the call. And the King of Diamonds is quite possibly one of the greatest cards for Linus okay. to pick up. Needing equity present, but Aaron Zhang is just not shaken. A snap call. Does decide to give up. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Imagine you're playing a 50,000 euro tournament and are facing arguably the best poker player in the world. Are you comfortable entering the hand? What does actually make playing against a great player so difficult? And what is the reason that makes playing against your average rag feel like a trip to Disneyland while facing a high stakes crusher is a real life Stephen King movie? Let's put ourselves in Tom Fogelsang's shoes, a successful high stakes tournament player who in this hand is caught up in some heat against Linus Love. Facing an open from the cutoff and a flat from Linus on the button, Tom overcalls queen 3 suited in the big blind. He flops two pair and sees Linus taking a small 18% stab after the cutoff checks. So Linus is actually stabbing here. He's seen the preflop raiser give up. Tom decides to just call the bet and the two proceed to the turn. Alright, we see a call. On the turn, Linus fires another barrel, this time for 75% of the pot. Linus is like... I almost never want to predict what Linus is going to do because this guy is just on a different level, right? Tom check calls again and the river is a not very welcomed king. Unfortunately for Tom, Linus bears once more, putting in a healthy 110k, which represents almost half of Tom's remaining stack. If you were in his shoes, would you be able to call this bet? Thinking about all the hands which Linus could possibly be bluffing in this spot, a few obvious candidates come to mind. Flush draws like 4 5 through 8 9 of hearts could be flared at preflop by Linus and be bluffing through. More bluffing combos that come to mind would be. well, what would they be? All hands that were straight draws on the turn are now either a straight or at least a pair of kings, which should have a good enough reason to check behind and hope to be good at showdown. So besides just a few combos of missed flush draws, we are facing a range that can definitely have a lot of 10x straights. To get a clearer view of the ranges in play, we will ask the solver for help. However, since we are entering the flop with 3 players, we cannot use a regular solver that can only calculate pots with 2 players included. For this situation, we will use simple 3-way instead, which lets us simulate multi-way pots with 3 players. We'll calculate the GTO preflop ranges for the players in play using simple preflop and transfer them to simple three-way. Calculating the flop, we can see that Linus is supposed to stab for his chosen sizing in 60% of the time, given he only uses this sizing, which we will assume for simplification reasons. The big blind, or Tom in this case, should also basically only have a calling range. Yes, there's a tiny amount of raises going on and queen three is actually one of them. But in practice, simplifying your strategy and having no raises instead of having to balance another range should probably always be the better choice in this situation. 
On the turn, we see Linus's range barreling in 64% of the time. For the big blind's response, the solver now does want to have a raising range, and Queen 3 should be mostly a part of that, especially the club combo. But since calling and raising are quite close in EV, calling can't be that big of a mistake. Other hands to raise would be value hands like King 10, Pocket 3s, and Ace 3, while adding bluffs in form of mostly combo draws like gut shots with a flush draw. But before we break down the river play, let's see what actually happened in the 110K. hand. 110k. Wow. Disgusting. Wow. wow. High level. And here, queen three starts is like, all right, let me just sort of pot control. Let me sort of whatever. And this is just, this is artwork right there. What a hand. So Tom decides to fold, probably figuring that Linus's bluff combos are simply not enough. But did Linus actually have it? Or did he have one of the few missed flush draws? Well... Neither nor. He bet the flop, barreled the turn, and followed through on the river with pocket fives. Does that make sense? Isn't pocket fives, being a pair, good enough to try to bring the showdown and should therefore be checked down? Well, yes and no. And not seeing black and white is what makes a great poker player. Let's go back to the flop. Being checked to, pocket fives is a clear part of the 60% betting range in Linus's shoes. Being in position, he can take a cheap stab with a lot of hands and fold out a bunch of his opponent's hands. Especially pocket fives is low enough that betting folds out many of their unconnected milling cards that have life outs against him. And additionally, he should get caught by a bunch of flush draws that he is even ahead of. The turn is where it gets interesting. We can see that according to the solver, pocket fives is only bet a fraction of the time. But especially his and the other hard combos do want to go for it sometimes. Why you might ask? Well, while the hand could definitely try to show down against the flush draw, there is also a reason for betting which we slightly touched earlier on. And it is also one important trait that differentiates a top-notch player from an ABC rag. Having a hand like pocket fives in your range provides you with the ability to have more than the average guy's busted draws as a bluff on the river. The king of diamonds is already a river card that completes a bunch of draws, but imagine the river being a king of ten of hearts. How many bluffs do you think the average ABC rack who follows the protocol of 101 poker will have? Correct. Zero. So how often will he get paid by a thinking opponent when he makes the nuts on a runout like this? Never. Correct again. Being able to have bluffs in your range that are not natural, which means unmade hands with a lot of equity on previous streets, so mostly draws, is what makes playing against you extremely difficult. Not only does it make your bluffs go through a lot, as your perceived range simply might not include many unmade hands, it also opens the door to get paid by good regs who are paying attention and notice that you are capable of having bluffs in any situation. And after all, getting paid off with your value bets is where most of your profit usually comes from. In this example, the solver actually favors suited connectors like 5-6 through 8-9 that are not flush draws to barrel the turn to provide unnatural bluffs. In contrast to pocket 5s or pocket 4s, they can't just check back and potentially win at showdown. But at the same time, they have almost no equity, while pocket 5s and pocket 4s have at least 2 outs to making a huge hand. After all, the EVs between checking and betting are close for both the suited connectors as well as the pocket pairs. So interchanging which of them you are using as your bluffs should not impact your overall EV. That said, and with all the above in mind, Tom's Queen 3 should actually have been a GTO call. He does have some 10x in his range, but other than that, his overall range will consist of too many folds if he only continues with his straight hands. For this sizing, Linus should still have a decent amount of two parent sets as value bets. And blocking ace queen, pocket threes, and pocket queens, queen three appears to be one of the best bluff catchers. Granted, against many players, folding anything but a straight would be a good exploit due to their lack of bluffs, but not against Linus Love aka the king of GTO. Okay.
How do you exploit the best cash game players in the world? Well, first you gotta say Fuck GTO, GTO has got to go Second, you need to make them play after your rules And third, you take advantage of their mistakes No, this doesn't mean you should become a field player What this means is don't take the first output the solver gives you and blindly follow it Let's take this spot as an example If we put in two bet sizes as an option for the button to see bet, we'll see PO Solver give us a result that is basically range betting for a small sizing on a flop. Stefan says, fuck that. How do we know? Well, he checks behind. I think it's safe to assume that he knows that having a small sizing in the spot would result in a range betting strategy. So seeing him have a checking range leads to only one conclusion, which is that he's playing a big bet or check strategy. Of course we don't know if that is a 75% pot bet or check, or an over bet or check strategy, or something in between. What we do know is, he doesn't use the first strategy the solver gives him, and is even sacrificing some EV. Why would he do that? Well maybe... Because no one else is doing that. At least not to this extent. If everyone studies the same spots, it is hard to make them make any mistakes. But if you force someone into a spot which he hasn't studied to the same extent that you have, then you can gain a massive edge. Even if in an optimal world, you'd gain more EV with the conventional line. But that's the thing. There is no optimal world as long as you play with humans. No one plays perfect in every spot. But that is the premise that the solver's results are built upon. Against Barry Sweet, we can watch a similar thing happen. Against the rather large 4-bet, Ace 4 suited shouldn't be a defend in Barry's shoes in the first place. Adding to that, Stefan is making his own rules regarding c-betting. According to the solver, Stefan should never go for this tiny 17% sizing, but rather bet one third part whenever he decides to c-bet. And against the 17%, Ace-4 suited is never being raised. King-6 suited with the backdoor flush draw can still call the raise, but on the turn, it should actually check behind. And the preferred sizing isn't even a one-third pot bet, but much smaller. Unless, of course, you're getting called by a combo that should not be called. And getting bluffed by it on the river. A nice payout for an un-GTO line. And we can witness a similar outcome against the end boss liners. Against the check, the big blind's bet size should indeed be mostly an overbet. However, 4-7 of diamonds is not a part of that. The solver wants to have flush draws and gut shot straight draws as bluffs, which have much more equity than an unimprovable hand like 4-7. So it looks like Linus might be overbluffing here. And the fact that Stefan calls a hand that should actually be folded might lead to the assumption that he even expects Linus to overbluff here. The river should then also be an overbet with this combo, instead of a 75% pot bet. By overbetting, you are creating fold equity against these lower ace x hands, which can call the 75% pot bet much more often. Now you might think that instead of having multiple bet sizing options in this spot, Linus might just simplify and use a 75% pot bet only. But even then, the solver doesn't like betting for 7 and just checks and gives up. Either way, for Stefan, 10-8 is even a GTO call, and it is scooping him another nice pot, simply because he put Linus in a spot where he would deviate from GTO and bluff a combo which he shouldn't. Where can you implement some lines into your game that may not be well explored by your opponents? If you think people don't make a lot of mistakes in certain spots, go switch it up and put them in spots they don't know. Of course, you have to know the spots. So study hard, but study smart.
Okay. One of the biggest tournaments of the year with a whopping $200,000 buy-in and a first place prize of $5.5 million. Are we surprised to see Linus Lulega aka Linus Love being one of the three remaining players? Having maneuvered his way through a field of 115 players, he finds himself in the following situation. Third in chips and with nine big blinds we have Karl Schappagatien, a non-pro player who is actually playing his first tournament here. Chip leader with 59 big blinds is Sam Grafton, a long time and very successful player who has made millions being a tournament pro. Linus is sitting as second in chips and with 18 big blinds, as he enters this hand with pocket sevens. Carl folds on the button and Linus decides to limp his sevens. King nine, Linus limping the sevens. With a big pay jump from second to third place, being passive and preserving your stack so that you won't bust before the short stack will be the best play considering ICM. <sighs> Right? Wrong. Looking at the representative simulation in GTO Wizard including the ICM factor, we can see that pocket 7s would mostly prefer going all in themselves. Linus might have made a frequency play here, or he was basing his decision too much on the chip EV solution of this spot, in which pocket 7s would mostly limp. Or he wanted to lower his risk of busting, because he estimated that his edge, especially against the short stack call, was big enough to deviate from theory. Unfortunately, we can't look inside his head. King 9 off is a clear checkback for Sam and we see a Jack Deuce 3 rainbow flop. Here, we do see how ACM makes us play passively. According to Chip EV, we should be betting around 40% of our hands in Linus' shoes and make use of our overall range advantage. However, with ICM, Linus should check 100% of his range to keep the pot small and minimize his risk of busting before the short stack. With a difference of 1.3 million dollars between second and third, I think we can agree that the pay jump is significant. Sam has the big stack on the other hand, is incentivized to bet more aggressively with ICM in play and put pressure on the small blind who has to play tighter. Actually, he would have to bet his entire range. However, he checks back his king nine and we see an ace on the turn. With such a scary turn card, we want to continue being passive and just try to make it to showdown at any price. Right? Wrong again. Since Linus checked range on the flop in this scenario, he is uncapped on the turn and all of his strong hands, straights like 4-5 suited down to a pair of jacks, like to get value. We can see that pocket pairs can bet as well, but more so the lower ones than the higher ones. So while 4s and 5s like betting, pocket 6s and 7s actually prefer a check. This is likely because the higher pocket pairs are less concerned with protection, while the lower ones fold out many hands that have 6 outs against them. In spots where the solver suggests a range bet, but the player checks, it isn't unlikely that their range is weighted more towards hands that like to check down. This doesn't have to be the case with Sam, as he is an extremely experienced player, but it might let Linus assume his range is now more bottom heavy on the turn. Which means he will have many 2x, 3x and king highs in his range, which are too good to fold, as Linus will still have bluffs as well. Linus bets even though pocket 7s would prefer to check according to the sim, but EVs are close, so it's definitely not a big mistake, if any at all. Wow, he gets king 9 to call. Okay. The river brings a 10, and if you don't want to again assume playing passively is the play, then you are right this time. Because more important than potential overcards to your pair is the range that you're playing against. In this spot, Sam would likely raise many aces preflop. The same goes for a jack, which would also often bet on the flop. A 10 isn't very likely, because there are few combinations of 10x hands that call the turn bet. However, there are many hands worse than 7s, which would often take this line. Among those are pairs of 3s and deuces, and in the simulation, Sam would also need to call the small bet with king and even some queen high. He does fold his king 9 however, which means this would have been a good spot for Linus to bluff more than optimal. After all, Linus's play shows that preserving your chips and keeping you alive in a tournament does matter, but even under heavy ICM pressure, 
you shouldn't only play passively, even against the big stack. In contrary, you want to pick your spots to play aggressively. This allows you to chip up and gives you the opportunity to widen the gap between you and the short stack and make it to the next page. Oh, wow. Ace Runs King. into the Snap. Ace King. And we lose one of the fan favorites, Carl Chappé Gatien. <laughs> Marcus Lykonen completes a6 off against Linus' straddle, who checks. Both plays are fine, even though they could both also raise their hands. On the flop, Marcus's most preferred sizing would be a rare overbet, combined with a lot of checks. 7-3 off would always bet, and also for the sizing Linus chose. Interestingly, Marcus's a6 combo would always fold here, and only the 6 of hearts continues. Likely because Linus shouldn't bet 6-3 and 6-4 of hearts, which don't have a backdoor flush draw. The turn can then be donged, but checking is also fine. 7-3 is again a clear bet, as practiced by Linus. And a6 clearly calls. On the river though, 7-3 wouldn't be a bluff, and is losing around 0.6 big blinds. But a6 is a clear call. If your friend was in this spot and even just thought about calling, you would beg the gods to finally send you some poker friends that aren't complete donkeys. But would you think differently if Linus Love, the best poker player in the world, made that call? And what about Crusher Berry Sweet? Is bottom pair the new nuts now? In this video we're going to discover the most important factor for bluff catching and also learn why poker is far from being dead. Let's start with this hand. So Linus opens the button, Barry calls and Linus seabets the flop for one third. Barry decides to check raise his second pair with top kicker and Linus calls. Barry checks on the turn 10 and Linus overbets. Barry calls and faces another overbet on the river for 2x pot. He does decide to call and loses to Linus' pocket 10s. If we check PO solver, the flop play is reasonably standard. C betting pocket tens is done a decent amount of the time, and check raising ace five has the benefit of folding out these unconnected holdings, which still have overcards to the five. Also, you'll get value from weaker fives, a three, ace highs, and straight draws. Pocket tens are a pure call, and on a board this dry, overall there's not much three betting going on. Interestingly, if given multiple bet sizing options on the turn, the solver actually prefers a different sizing than an overbet. We'll get back to why Linus might have chosen this sizing, however, at a later point in the video. Now, facing the overbet and the jam on the river, Barry has good blockers to Linus's pocket fives, and also ace queen on the river, so it is one of his better bluff catchers. Right? And then Linus's 8-4 must be 2. He also faced a triple barrel including 2 overbets on the turn and the river. And while he blocks Barry's value hands only with the 8, at least he unblocks all of Barry's bluffs by having a 4, so that he can still have all the queen 9, 9 10, 9 7 and potentially more in his range. Right? Well actually, it's a no for both of them. According to Pio Solver, 8-4 is a clear fold on the river and even on the turn already. On the flop, 8-4 is a clear call for Linus. As in position is betting more than two thirds of his range, 8-4 is a clear call for Linus on the flop. The three of hearts on the turn is a relative blank, which allows Barry to overbet due to his nut advantage. Barry still has all good top pairs and better in this range, while Linus would three bet some of those combinations pre-flop or check raise them on the flop. And against this overbet, 8-4 is simply a pure fold according to the solver. The worst bluff catchers that still get called appear to be weak jack X and some bottom pair with the ace kicker. And on the river, the only calling hands that are not two pair or better are pairs that also have a straight blocker. And the same goes for Barry's ace 5, which also is a fold on the river and even close on the turn. Against the turn overbet, ace 5 is a zero EV bluff catcher and a pure fault on the river, losing at 1.4 BB in EV. So what, is this just NL2 where nobody ever folds a pair? Do these guys simply not know that their hands are a GTO fold? Well of course it could be, but I don't think that's the reason. And even though I cannot read their minds, I don't think they misevaluated which hands they should be calling down, according to Equilibrium. 
What I think is more likely is that they assumed the other guy simply wasn't playing an equilibrium strategy. Let me show you. This is the button's equilibrium betting range on the turn. We can see that the bluffing region mostly consists of low cards with a straight draw, like 4-6, 4-deuce and 6-deuce. Now if we modify the betting range and only change the frequency of one hand, which will be 6-deuce in this example, and double their already low betting frequencies from 11% to 22% and 25% to 50% for the hard combo, and rerun the simulation, we can see that ace5 already becomes a winning call on the turn. On the river we have to apply the same principle and even only add 10% to each of these four combos and ace5 again becomes a profitable call. This just goes to show that the EV of hero calling a hand can be incredibly sensitive to the bluffing frequencies. I mean, which human is gonna know that they are not allowed to bluff a combo for 22% but only for 11 and then apply that not only to one combo but every single one in their range? It's practically impossible. With that in mind we can revisit our 8 forehand. However, we have to do a little more modifying here. On the turn, we have to make all the straight draws bluff at full frequency and also up some of these random hands bluffing frequencies. Then 8 4 starts to become a profitable call. This might look like a big deviation, but it's not unlikely that Linus thinks Barry could be overbluffing in this spot, as he is definitely not the guy who can't show up with random bluffs. And then on the river, Barry is actually not allowed to bluff any missed Queen 9, 9 7, and just a tiny amount of 9 10. So adding a few percent to those 9 10 combos quickly gets us to 8 4 being a river call. Of course you can basically always justify any call this way and it's surely not impossible that Linus just made a mistake here. For what it's worth, he also ran into Ace King. But either way, I think that this goes to show that even among the best players, poker is not a game of blindly chasing GTO frequencies, but maybe more than ever, an interesting search for ways to exploit your opponents, which leads us to the pieces that you can take away from this video. One. Instead of thinking about whether your own hand is a GTO call or not, think about if your opponent is likely to differ from a GTO line. Especially at low stakes, no one almost ever plays GTO, so it's more important to know how they differ. Is it too much bluffing? Or none at all? 2. Exploit through bet sizing. If you assume an opponent might make mistakes against a specific sizing, but maybe not against another one, use the one which exploits his mistakes, even if it is not preferred by the solver. Linus executed this when he thought Barry might call down too light against a bet size that shouldn't even be used in the first place. And he was right. 3. Don't be afraid to bluff catch even if your hand is normally considered a fold. If you have a reason to believe your opponent is over bluffing and only then put away the fear of making a wrong call and looking like an idiot. Facing an aggressive opponent is uncomfortable, but what can be even more uncomfortable is an aggressive opponent who is constantly overbetting. What can you do when you are in tough spots all the time and don't want to fold away your money, but also don't want to pay your opponent off when you have a marginal hand? Well, who would be a better role model to learn from than THE end boss Linus Love, who is facing some pressure from notorious overbetter Stefan Burakov aka Stefan11222. In this hand, Linus opens the button with aces and gets called by Stefan. Linus decides to check back the flop. After facing another check from Stefan on the turn, he also checks back the turn. On the river, Stefan throws in a 30% block bet. 
After having played deceptively on the previous streets, Linus goes for a value race with his aces. However, Stefan goes ahead and does Stefan things. Raise. Big. In Linus's shoes, how do we make a decision here? Well, even if we may not be a GTO wizard like him, we can still use GTO wizard for studying. Yeah, that was corny. Recreating the line of the hand, we can see that according to the GTO solution, aces are indeed checked back some amount of the time on the flop. 35% for this combo. The small blind isn't doing too bad on this flop. But having a bunch of high cards that want to check back and realize their equity against a pretty large amount of check raises from the big blind, we want to protect our checking range by checking back some high pocket pairs as well. On the turn, the big blind will mostly bet his strong hands. So a lot of their checking range will consist of absolute air hands. Against these, aces don't need protection, but in contrast want them to catch up. If they make a pair on the river or decide to bluff, we'll gain much more than by just having them check fold the turn. Now on the river, Stefan's range mostly wants to bet small just like he actually did. There are still some nutty hands as well as complete air included, but most of these hands are low, medium and top pair hands and even some ace highs going for thin value. Against that range, aces are an easy race. Alongside other slow played over pairs, trips and river top pairs. Now, Stefan's actual 3-bet sizing isn't included in this solution, but the according range will most likely be something in between these two sizings, which are an all-in and a race to 19 big blinds, which would be $3,800 in this end. Following the GTO solution, that range includes trip 5s to 100%, sets and straights, and ace highs as bluffs. And against both the 19 big blind raise, as well as the shove, aces end up being a very slim bluff catcher, with Linus's combo favoring calling. While aces block Stefan's ace 4 straights, they also block his main bluffs, which should be ace high according to the solution. However, there are still some very small amounts of random trash hands left that are bluffing, which leads to Linus's aces being a profitable call in theory. Before we see what happened in the hand, let's double the stakes and move up to a 200-400 hand. Stefan opens the button, Linus calls and the flop goes check check again. After tanking for a while, Linus decides not to bet his nut flush draw on the turn. Instead, he faces a 75% pot bet from Stefan and check calls. He doesn't river a flush, but a mere pair of eights. And since it was so fun, Stefan pumps out another overbet. Looking at the GTO solution, checking back the flop would be Stefan's play around 50% of the time, basically mixing most hand classes. On the turn, Linus would be betting a little less than half the time. Mostly strong hands like straights, sets, two pair and some top pairs as well as total air. While low pairs and king highs mostly check. And even though it is being checked around 10% of the time, his actual hand, king 8 of clubs, clearly prefers betting. Facing the check, Stefan would then favor a small bet in theory. This would allow him to not only bet nut hands like straights, sets and two pair, but also top pairs and even lower ones like 5x and 4x. His in-game sizing is barely used and much more polarized, consisting of 2x straights, sets, some underpairs and then pure air. Against this range, king eight of clubs is an easy call, as it's not only drawing to the nuts, but also ahead of Stefan's air part of his range. As it's already polarized on the turn, and there is no point in betting some of the medium strength hands on the river, his betting range will now be nuts, 2 pair plus, or a nothing, which is the perfect condition for an overbet sizing. Facing this sizing, Linus has to think about which hands he now wants to defend. When facing an overbet and therefore a polarized range, you are mostly sitting on a range full of bluff catchers, all of which beat your opponent's bluffs, but lose against their value hands. 
So making a decision doesn't depend on the absolute strength of your hand, but much more on the blocking effect. You can block your opponent's value hands. In this case, that would be blocking two pair and sets by having a pair yourself. You can't block their straights, however, as having a two simply makes you have a straight as well. So besides blocking value hands, you also want to think about unblocking bluffs. By choosing the right combos to call, you are allowing your opponent to have more bluffs in their range and thus shifting their relative amount of value hands. We can see this effect if we look at the calling hands in Linus' spot. Even though a6 and a7 are better hands than king8 in an absolute sense, they are mostly folded, whereas king8 is a pure call. This is because the 6 and the 7 block some of Stefan's most frequent bluffs, which would be 10-6, 10-7, jack-6, jack-7, and queen-6, queen-7. King high, however, is not bluffed in his shoes, so Linus's king-8 doesn't block any bluffs. So the next time you are facing an overbet, or just a big bet when you have a bluff catcher, think about whether you block value and or unblock bluffs. And if your opponent is capable of bluffing, base your decision on your hand's blocking ability. And independent of that, always remember, whether you are making the correct call in the long run or not, sometimes you will lose, and sometimes you will win. Viktor Malinowski opens king-queen suited and Linus calls 7-5 off which he can do being in the straddle and getting great odds. On the low connected flop he could dunk bet, but decides not to. Viktor's range doesn't really hit this board, so he checks back. On the turn Linus block bets, which the solver would do with his complete range. I'm not sure why Viktor calls his king-queen, because the solver would never, and Linus can't really over bluff here, because... Well, you can't bet more than 100% of your range. On the river, Linus's hand would be a check, but he manages to get some super thin value. Did he actually expect Victor to call some king highs on the turn? Okay. High stakes and micro stakes have one thing in common. You don't always understand what's going on. To see what kinds of mistakes happen on NL10 and how NL10K players avoid those, let's look at an example. On NL10 you might see hands like this. The big blind 3 bets king queen and decides to check on 883 suited. Already we see that this is a suboptimal play, as the big blind would have an easy range bet according to the solver. As the preflop 3 better, the big blind has on average better hands in the range than the button who would 4 bet their best ones. And by betting 40% with all of them, they force the button to continue with hands as weak as 5-6 and 6-7, even without a backdoor flush draw. But since the big blind checks, the button decides to stab with pocket force, which is fine. Then the big blind check calls their king queen. On the turn, the button makes a full house and bets again. And the big blind check calls again. Just to make a pair on the river and you might have guessed it. Dark jam it. Now I'm sure most of you have witnessed plays like this where a player just plays their hand for what it is. Check call when they have nothing and then suddenly bet when they do hit a hand. 
a terrible play that you want to avoid and exploit instead. Right? Well, it's just that this hand was actually played at ML10K and the players were Stefan11222 and Linus Love, the absolute end bosses of the game. Still a terrible play? Let's look into it more thoroughly. So even though our perception of the players and the game has changed, the theory hasn't. 883 suited is still a range bet on the flop, even for Stefan. But, as already covered in a previous video, Stefan likes to deviate from theory, to take his opponents to lines they haven't studied before. By navigating them down paths that most have never seen or studied before, he can make use of his more exploitative approach. Knowing this, he will likely have more hands in his checking range than this simulation and his range might look different. Still, bear with me while we explore the action according to this game tree and I'll shortly explain why it doesn't really matter anyway regarding the point of this video. So let's look at the check calls on the flop and turn. Why would you do that if you're not a fish on NL10? According to the solver, the flop, if at all, would like to be raised with Broadway hands and the turn is just a fold for King Queen. But wait, what was that? There's some green in there. Here, King of Hearts, Queen of Diamonds can be caught sometimes on a turn. And on a flop as well. Yeah, I know what you're thinking now. You can really justify anything with solvers today. And I don't blame you. I agree you don't want to focus on finding some super low frequencies and then justify your play by calling it a frequency play. However, this way of thinking reveals an approach towards solvers that is not useful in the first place. You shouldn't look at a solution and take the numbers literally. Instead, you want to read between the lines. And for this example, what you can find there is the fact that hearts and diamonds make for better calls than other suits. Why? Well, that's the right question. For that, we look into what the other player's action would be. And we find that on the flop, as well as on the turn, the button's bluffing range contains many king and queen eggs, suited and offsuit. However, most of them are spades and clubs, and not hearts and diamonds. So with king queen of hearts and diamonds, Stefan unblocks a lot of Linus's bluffs. And since we are heads up and ranges are wide, king queen simply is still a relatively good hand which is ahead of many combos, which I guess showcases a similarity between terrible players and geniuses. And the reason this play is probably viewed as terrible when played by an average NPC, but also analyzed by people like me when Stefan does the same thing, is simply that the play of the hand itself doesn't mean a lot. What really matters is the range that is played. If Stefan wasn't able to construct his ranges in a way that carefully selects combos for certain plays instead of just playing his exact hand, Linus could easily crush him. When we see Stefan make this play, what we see is an aware decision to take this combo as a check call. When we see this guy make the same call, in our minds we see him check call every king queen in this spot. Of course, this is a generalization and not everybody on NL10 plays like this but it is something that separates good players from the bad. That's why using a solver to find tendencies for which hands would be better as calls, instead of trying to memorize which hands are defined as calls, serves you much better. By focusing on takeaways like this, it is not only easier to remember what you've learned, but you can also use them in spots which you haven't seen before. For example, when an exploitative guy like Stefan or an unstudied recreational tries to take you down the dark places of poker theory. How to explore such takeaways for yourself is something that I teach in my upcoming course on effective solver use. So if you want to build theoretical knowledge which you can apply at the tables to play poker with confidence, sign up to the list below and you'll be the first to know when the course is released. That way you can make sure to not make the same mistakes as an average low stake player. And if you want to learn more from these two end bosses, this video will be perfect for you to watch next.